Okay, now take your Bibles up into the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 26. We're going to look at two different men tonight in this uh, study as Jesus was in the mock trial in the middle of the night before uh, Caiaphas, the high priest, the one that had been appointed by the Roman uh, government as uh, Annas was the the high priest, his father-in-law, and uh, then Caiaphas was appointed by the Romans. And so they, they led him to Annas first and then to Caiaphas, and it was a mock trial, as I so clearly uh, mentioned to you last week, because of the fact that it was during the night anyway. They were not, it was, that was illegal. They were not supposed to have their court sessions in the night. And uh, they were supposed to wait until the daytime. And, and and also because of the fact that it was so unfair, uh, Jesus had no defense uh, because uh, the judge and the jury and the prosecution all were the Sanhedrin. And um, But it's not that he would want to defend himself anyway because his mission was to die for us on the cross. So we find, uh, beginning with chapter 26, verse 69, it says that now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou wast uh, with Jesus of Galilee. So uh, I'm going to stop right there, and uh, we'll ask the Lord to, to bless what we study together here this evening. And let me say, let's uh, take Peter and go all the way back to the beginning of his life as a follower of Jesus. If you remember when Jesus began his ministry and he was calling his disciples, in Matthew chapter 4, he called some Galilean fishermen. Uh, James and John were two of them. Uh, the other two Galilean fishermen he called were Peter and Andrew. And uh, here's how it all happened. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20, it says Jesus was walking by the Sea uh, of Galilee. And he saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers, they were fishermen. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway or immediately they left their nets, and they began to follow Jesus. But that is not when Peter professed his faith in Jesus as being his Savior. He did not know him to be the Savior at that time. He, he just saw him as being a very intriguing person that he was interested in following, as Jesus called him. And then we find later on in Matthew 16, that at a place called Caesarea Philippi, Jesus had gathered his disciples together and he asked them the question, point blank, he said, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who, who are... Who are they, you know, some, they, some thought he was uh, John the Baptist, come back to life, uh, who had been killed by Herod. Some thought he was Elijah, come back to this earth. Some thought he was a great prophet. He said, whom do you say that I am? And uh, Peter answered. Peter was the one who always spoke up. Peter was the, the one who always uh, would speak first. And he was kind of the leader of the group. And he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus' response to him in Matthew 16, verse 18 was, And thou art Peter. And the name Peter means rock. Thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church. And he was not insinuating or suggesting that the church was built on Peter, but on Peter's confession, his acknowledgement, that Jesus was the Savior. So I think in my, in my own heart, in my own mind, I believe that that is when Peter uh, made a profession of faith in Christ Jesus, when he acknowledged him as being the, the son of the living God, the Christ. Jesus, right after that, then told those disciples, including Peter, and said to them in Matthew 16, verse 24, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now what Jesus was telling Peter and the other disciples there at that time 
was if you're going to truly be a follower of me, you must be willing to take up your cross. That is, you must be willing to suffer and even die for me if need be. So that's what he told them. Now, we then find that later on, Jesus had told his disciples as he was uh, drawing nearer and nearer to the time when he was to die on the cross. And in Matthew 16, verses uh, 26, rather, verses 34 and 35, Jesus said to them, specifically, he was speaking to Peter. And in Matthew 26, 34 and 35, Jesus said to Peter, Verily I send to thee that this night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice, but Peter, no, Peter abruptly and just interrupted him perhaps and said, no, 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 no. He said, though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. Likewise said all of those disciples. Now Luke in his version of the same story wrote it down like this. Luke said in Luke 22, 33 and 34, since Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready, I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. Yeah, right, Peter. Peter said that. I'm ready to go to prison for you, Jesus. I'm ready to die for you. And Jesus said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day until or before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Now as they're drawing nearer and nearer to the cross, and before this mock trial at the palace of Caiaphas, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was praying, he took the inner circle of disciples, which was James, John, and Peter, with him. He told them, you stop here and you pray while I go and pray yonder. And that's what he did. But when he came back, he found Peter, James, and John in a slumber. They had fallen asleep. He awoke them and said, I'm going to pray some more. And they fell asleep again. In Matthew 26, 41, Jesus told them, watch and pray. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. For the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I believe he was specifically, even more so, perhaps directing that conversation or those words to Peter himself. Watch and pray, Peter, that you enter not into temptation. Your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. When the trying time came, Peter fell, and he fell miserably. As we go back and look at chapter 26, verse 58, it says after they had taken him to the home of Chi uh, Annas, and then to the home of Caiaphas, it says Peter followed, verse 58, see it? Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace. And he went in and he sat with his servants to see the end. He wanted to see how it was all going to unfold. Everything was going to happen. But Peter, uh, the thing I want you to notice, verse 58, says he followed him afar off. He drifted. He had backslidden. Peter acknowledged him as being the Lord, the Christ, the Son of the living God, at Caesarea Philippi. Jesus said, take up your cross if you're going to follow me. Now's the time to take up his cross. He wasn't willing to do that. So he followed him from a distance, from afar off as he's watching. When we follow Jesus from afar off, we're not close to him. And if we're not close to him, we are more apt to sin and do things or go places or see things or say things or think things that are unbecoming of a child of God. Now, Peter was following from afar off as we see there. Then I want you to see, as we pick up with our scripture in verse 69 of chapter 26, Peter sat without the palace. When it says he sat without, that means outside. He was out in the front yard called the courtyard. He was out in the courtyard of the high priest's palace. 
he set out there, and a damsel came to him. The word damsel is a word which means young girl, not an older woman. But a young girl had come to him, and she said, Thou wast with Jesus of Galilee. She says, I know you were. I've seen you before. You were with him. What does Peter do? Peter should have taken up his cross to follow Jesus and should have staunchly defended Jesus and stood up for him. But to the contrary, instead he lied. He flat out told a lie. He said, I know not what thou sayest. Again, Jesus had said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Peter wanted to do right, but his flesh was weak, and he had fear. He was fearing man rather than fearing God. When we fear man instead of fearing God, these kind of things happen. So this is what was happening with Peter. He told a lie. Verse 71 says, when he was going out into the porch. Now, the word porch there means gate. He was in the front yard. He wasn't even inside the palace. But he went to the, but he could see inside. He could hear and see what's going on. But he goes to the gate. Another maid saw him. And the word maid there, like damsel, means young girl. Not an older woman, but another young lady had come to him and said unto them that were there, this fellow was, with, was uh, also with Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth was in Galilee, is a Galilean town. Peter was a Galilean, as was John, James, and Andrew. Now, it says, uh, she said, he was with this Jesus of Nazareth. And again, Peter this time denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And by saying with an oath, it's like he's saying, I swear, I swear, I do not know the man. He had gone from a lie to swearing on an oath. Now, then it says in verse 73, And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said unto Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. Bereath? You may think, where in the world have I ever heard of that word? If you're reading from another version, it'll be betrayeth. Because it's just an old King James word, which means betray. So your speech betrayeth thee. It'd be kind of like some of us here in the deep south going up to New York City and speaking. Our language would show that we are not from up there, right? Could you imagine the governor of our state going to New York City, pretending he is a citizen of that state with his southern accent that he has? Oh, my goodness. So that's why it was with Peter. So the Galilean accent was unique. They spoke, uh, it, it, was, it was kind of a Hebrew, a version of the Hebrew, but it was a unique, esoteric language or accent which means it was unique to a certain group of people. Just like here in the Deep South. I mean, people in Alabama talk different than the people of Georgia do, and the people of Georgia talk different than the people of South Carolina do. We all talk different, but anyway, you can tell. They, they, they could say, Peter, he, he's a Galilean fisherman. And, and we can tell by his strong Galilean accent. Now, but he began to curse and swear curse now some people say that the, the the fishermen of the seas of Galilee and the storms would curse and perhaps this is he's revolting back and slipping back into some of his older ways before he had come to know Christ he began to curse as well as swear and he said I know not the man and immediately the cock crowed the cock crowed after he denied him three times just like Jesus said would happen. And, and then says he went out, uh, and, and Peter remember rather, Peter remembered verse 75, the word of, the, of Jesus which said, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. 
And he went out and wept bitterly. He was under deep conviction because of what he had just done. As he had denied his Savior. Now, Luke tells us something a little extra that Matthew, Mark, and John did not tell us. And and that's found in Luke 22, verse 61. And it is this. He said, the Lord turned back and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. How he had said unto him, before the cock crow thou shalt thrice deny me. The, the, The look. Luke said Jesus looked at him. Can you imagine what that look might have been like? Was it a look of anger? Was it a look of, I I told you you would do that? Was it a look of unforgiveness? Was it a look of uh, compassion? I believe it was a look of pity and compassion. A penetrating look. And Peter saw that. Their eyes connected. And then Peter wept bitterly. Now, In the meantime, as the morning comes along, that was all during the night. It says in verse 1 of chapter 27, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and the elders of the people, that is the Sanhedrin, which was the judge, jury, and prosecution, had took counsel and determined and come up with their own verdict, and that is that Jesus must be put to death. But there's a problem. They could not put someone to death in Israel. It was against the law. At once upon a time, they could stone someone to death, but the Romans would not allow them to do this, and the only ones that could actually put someone to death at that time were the Romans, the Roman government that was controlling the the people. So they, they huddled up together, and they thought, we can't have them put to death. We want them dead, but we can't do it. So we've got to come up with some kind of charge. If, if it's blasphemy, the, the Roman governor will not fall for that. He will not accept that because he, he could care less if Jesus claims to be God. So they thought about this and thought, well, we'll make him a revolutionary, an insurrectionist. We'll, we'll say to, to the governor that he is drawing a crowd and, and that he is trying to uh, eventually usurp the role of king and place of, of uh, the emperor and that he calls himself king so they'll, they, they've come up with this charge that he was a revolutionary they thought surely that will do it so they take him to the palace of the Roman governor who was in control of that part of the world then that being Pilate we are going to see next week what happened when he stood before Pilate We're not going to see that tonight, but it says, verse 2, when they bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Now, see that little paragraph symbol at verse 3, because we go into a different uh, narrative here. We're going to leave this about him going before Pilate. In the meantime, what about Judas Iscariot? Remember him? Oh, yeah, we see that Peter denied him. What about Judas? Judas betrayed him. And Jesus said that would happen. At the last supper, he said, he that, uh, that dips his bread in the same dish as mine is the one who will betray me. And of course, we all saw that and we know it. It was Judas Iscariot. So let's look at that. In Matthew 26, 14 and 15, says this. One of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest and he said unto them, What will you give me, what will you give me if I will deliver Jesus unto you? And they covenanted or agreed for 30 pieces of silver, which amounted to and and worth today only about $15. So Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus for about $15. Can you imagine that? And in John 17, 12 says, and we can look at Judas and say how unfair. It says that he was with Jesus, but he was not of him. 
John 17, 12, Jesus said as much. He said, while I was with them in the world, he's praying to his Father, and he's talking to God, the Father, and he said, while I was with them, that, talking about the disciples in the world, I kept them in thy name, those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, except for the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. The son of perdition was Judas Iscariot. The word perdition just simply means waste. He wasted his life, as does anyone who rejects Christ and goes into eternity, into the fires of hell. They wasted their life. And any chance or opportunity they had of getting saved, they wasted it, blew it. Well, I do believe with all of my heart that Judas, like anyone, could have gotten saved if he had repented, but he didn't. He was the son of perdition. In Matthew 26, 24, Jesus said of Judas Iscariot, the son of man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man of whom the son of man is betrayed. It had been good for him if he had not been born. Anyone who dies lost rejects Christ and dies lost and goes to hell. It had been good if they had never been born. It had been good if this man had not been born. So we go to verse 3. Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself. He felt remorse. Just like Peter felt remorse when he betrayed or when he denied Jesus, Judas felt remorse when he betrayed Jesus. And so he brings the 30 pieces of silver, it says in verse 3, back to the chief priests and to the elders. He said, I have sinned that I have betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. The religious leaders didn't care. They knew it was blood money. They said, we don't care. We want him dead. So what is that to us? You feel bad that you have betrayed him into our hands. So Peter then cast down the pieces of silver, the $15 worth of coins, into the temple. And he departed. Why did he do that? It is believed that perhaps he was wanting to implicate the religious leaders in the crime, but maybe throwing the 30 coins back to them that maybe they would be guilty as well, but they didn't touch those coins when they were tossed back to them. Maybe he was thinking it was some sort of atonement for betraying the Son of Man, the Son of God, and by throwing the coins into the temple, maybe that was some sort of an atonement. That would not pay for his sins. Only thing that would pay for his sins was the blood that he had betrayed, that being the blood of Jesus. But he threw the, the coins down. Then he went and hanged himself. Maybe he thought by hanging himself and taking his own life that maybe since he felt remorseful about this, Judas Iscariot, that by hanging himself that he was so God that he would really felt bad about it. And there again, maybe he would it'd be some sort of atonement. But instead... As he breathed his last breath, his next one was choking on the flames of hell. He hung himself, and he died. Now, the chief priest took the silver pieces then. They picked them up. They said, it is not lawful for us to put this back into the treasury because it's the price of blood. It's blood money. So they could not put it back into the temple treasury. Got to do something with this money. Got to do something with it. And there was a field, and it's called uh, Alcadema. In fact, Alcadama. We see this in Acts chapter 1, 18 and 19. Just hold your place there, but listen to this. Now, this man, Judas Iscariot, purchased a field. You say, I thought that the priests purchased the field. They did, but it's basically indirectly... Judas Iscariot purchased it by betraying Jesus for those coins. And those coins were used to buy a field with a reward of iniquity. 
And verse 18 of Acts chapter 1 says that Peter fell headlong and burst asunder in the midst and his bowels gushed out. Now, it sounds like contradiction of Scripture. For in one place we find he hung himself. Then it says he fell down as if he were pushed down. No, most Bible scholars believe that what happened was no one would dare touch his body as he hung himself. And that the hot, the heat of the sun made his body eventually, after he had hung himself, fall to the ground. And he perhaps rolled down a hill and, and then this happened as his bowels gushed out and, uh, and he was burst asunder. What a way for a person to go. And it says in verse 19 of Acts chapter 1, is known unto all the dwellers of Jerusalem, insomuch that the field was called in the proper tongue Alkadama, which is to say, field of blood. And that that is exactly then, that is exactly where was it at in verse uh, verse eight says the field was called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled that which is spoken by Jeremy, or Jeremiah that is, the prophet, who once said. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave him them for the potter's field, as the Lord had appointed me. When and did Jeremiah say that? Where do we find those words? Go to the book of Jeremiah, right? No. Actually, go to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah is the one who quoted Jeremiah, and this is what it says in Zechariah. Chapter 11, 12, and 13. And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price. If not, forbear. So they weighed for the price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price, that it was priced, uh, prized of them. And they took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. So Jeremiah had said that as as uh, written by Zechariah in his book. But anyway, in conclusion, how am I going to wrap this thing up? There were two men, one Peter, one Judas. Peter was one who was a believer. I said that at Caesarea Philippi. He made this acknowledgement of faith. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Judas was there. But he did not make that profession of faith. It says to us, and Jesus is the one who said it, so you can bank on this. Jesus said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Matthew 7, 21. So just because Judas was with him does not mean he was saved. Judas missed the boat. Peter denied Jesus. He felt remorse. He saw the penetrating eyes of Jesus looking at him. And Peter wept bitterly. I believe it was genuine weeping. As he realized what he had done was wrong. And he he felt bad about it. Jesus met him on the shore of the sea after he had died and rose from the dead. And Peter got it right. And Peter went on to become the great man who preached one of the greatest sermons ever on the day of Pentecost. So Peter felt remorse for betraying or for denying Jesus, I should say, and he got it right. But Judas, he was with Jesus, but he was not of him. And he did not make that profession of faith. He betrayed Jesus. Anyone in life who is an unbeliever, when they die lost, they have betrayed Jesus for this world. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world? And lose his own soul. That's what happened to Judas. So two different men. Two completely different men. Both were followers. One was saved. And backslid. Came back home to the Lord. The other one. Never was with him. Now let us look at our own lives. Are we a Peter or are we a Judas? Let's make sure that we know him. As Peter did. There may be times we may backslide. 
and he'll forgive us. We can come back home to him. He loves us. We are the prodigal children sometimes, and he'll welcome us back with loving open arms. But let's make sure, let's do all we can to avoid getting into such a predicament. But if we do, we know he's there for us. But if we are a Judas and we don't know him, we're just a snap of a finger away from hell. And we need to make sure we're saved before it could be everlastingly too late. I thank you for listening. Let us pray.